So I get a message from my friend Jay Sher, who has the uh, oh my god, Matt, help me with the help me with Jay's podcast. Name. Okay, sorry, I got to go back to the. Uh, I keep blinking, blinking it. Yeah, hold on. It is. What the hell happened? Hold on. Uh, business. It's uh. Why is it not? Let me Jay. Why don't I write it down? It is business minds coffee chat business minds coffee chat there we go i'll leave it right there we'll cut we'll cut all this out and we'll start all over again the magic of editing yes exactly so i get a message from my friend jay share jay has a podcast called the business minds coffee chat and it's it's excellent if you get a chance to check it out he says he had he just interviewed someone who was really good and it would he would would i be interested in having him on my podcast and i'm you know i have a kind of a waiting list to be on the podcast and i'm generally trying to speak to people who are ceos who are in the c-suite and you know kind of on the job so i you know i have my fill of experts but Jay, Jay sends this guy to me and I start doing some research and I'm like, yeah, he seems really cool. He seems really good. Would have been great on the Mastering Overwhelm podcast. Not sure I want to do this. And then I start to figure it out. My next guest, uh, I saw his TED talk uh, a couple of years ago and I fell in love with this guy. I thought nobody teaches communications like him. Uh, it's so accessible, so, so simple and so human. Uh, and so effective, I was going, I, I bookmarked it and said, he's going to be on my podcast. Got to have him on my podcast. So Jay is sending me someone I already wanted to have here and had to have here. Officially, Matt Abrams, uh, Abrahams. Matt is, Abrahams, uh, yeah. Right? We, we had this conversation beforehand. I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing great here. Matt Abrahams. <laughs> is a leading expert in the field of communications. As a lecturer in organizational behavior at Stanford University's Graduate School of Business, he teaches a popular classes in strategic communications and effective virtual presenting and has received the school's alumni teaching award. Matt also teaches public speaking and co-teaches improvisationally speaking in the Stanford Continuing uh, Studies program. Uh, he's the host of the Think Fast, Talk Smart podcast. His new book of the same name is coming out in September. Can't wait to get that one. The book that I really like that he's been, uh, you know, living with for a while, Speaking Up Without Freaking Out, 50 Techniques for Confident and Compelling Presenting, which, by the way, is the name of the podcast, uh, uh, the TED Talk. And I'm going to put the link to that TED Talk in the show notes. Uh, it's helped a wide audience uh, manage speaking anxiety and present more confidently and authentically. Matt? Thanks for being on the podcast. Super happy to be here, Mark. Thank you. I love stumbling over my uh, introduction to you know my favorite <laughs> expert on communication. Uh, that's <laughs> no worries, no worries. That's all. so. For, let's let's just start off with what is glassophobia? Yeah, so many of us experience it. We just don't know the fancy name for it. So glossophobia refers to the fear of speaking in front of others. And those of us who study this believe it's innate to being human. We see it in every culture. We see it uh, arise mostly when, when kids enter into early teen years and it stays with us. But it's that fear that everybody knows when you get up in front of others or are put on the spot to speak where your heart races, your brow perspires, you, your mind gets a little jumbled. That's what we mean by fear of public speaking. So I've, I've done probably four or 500 talks and I still can't breathe before I get on stage. Like no matter what I do, what's that about? Well, so uh, I'll share a little bit why we think we have this fear. And then uh, I do believe we can learn to manage it. So I'll talk briefly about that as well. So we believe this is part of our biology, those of us who study this. Uh, it makes sense as, as humans evolved, we would hang out in a, a small groups, about 150 people, and your relative status in that group, and I'm not talking about who drives the fancy car or who's got the most social media likes. I'm talking about where you fit in the hierarchy, the pecking order, if you will. And those who had lower status were at risk. They were at risk of, of not having food, not having shelter, not getting access to reproduction. These are bad things. And so anything you do that risks that status, like getting up in front of others and making a gaffe or saying the wrong thing in the wrong way, that had pretty significant consequences. So it's we believe it's baked into who we are as, a human, as humans, but 
that doesn't mean we can't learn to manage it. Now, notice I'm not saying overcome it. I don't think we ever truly can overcome our anxiety. I think there is always a, a situation that can make us nervous when it comes to speaking, but we can certainly learn to manage it. And in fact, having a little anxiety is a good thing. It gives you energy, helps you focus. It tells you what you're doing is important. That's, that's so, what I love about your perspective is because most people want to eliminate that. They don't want to feel, they don't want to be human. And I don't want to beat that out of me before I go on stage, right? I, I want to bring that with me when, when in whatever I do. So I love that you that you bring that uh, in that fashion. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, yet we do want to learn to manage the anxiety. When it comes to managing anxiety, you have to take a two-pronged approach. You have to manage symptoms and sources. So what you just shared is, is it's hard to breathe. Your heart mm -hmm. rate starts beating really fast. Some of us sweat and blush. That's what happens to me. Others shake. And there's some things we can do to manage those symptoms, but there are also sources, things that initiate and exacerbate our anxiety. Mm -hmm. So happy to talk about those more, but the reality is we can do something to feel better about our anxiety around speaking. So you have a resource page on on your website, which I, like I got lost in. So uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna put in a, a good link. way, I hope. Yeah, we're gonna put a link to that also because there's you know everybody I know. I like I'm, I work with some people. Uh, I work with one guy who was the youngest guy in in, a, in on the leadership team, and he was terrified yeah. of public speaking. Yeah. Shook, monotone. It was just awful for him. Uh, and he wanted to be in a position to be considered to be CEO at some point. Right. So we've been working together for five years now. Right. Uh, every year, like before his big talk, and, and we we would work on this stuff. But he would get nervous, you know. And, and he was a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. He finally crushed the last one, and he is right. now in succession to be CEO. So this wow. public this public speaking thing is so important for your career. Being able to talk on stage, being able to talk to clients, being able to talk to your team and motivate motivate everybody, right? So so can you t talk about how how to give us some tips and tricks to to put us in the right mindset when we're speaking to people? Absolutely. So first, congratulations to the to the person you coach, because that's a great success story. Learning to manage anxiety can have very positive results. So a few things about mindset and then a few things that we can physically do. So a couple things that are that are very true. One, there's a disconnect between how we feel and how people perceive us. So when in all of my MBA students who take my strategic communication class, we do a presentation and I, and I digitally record them and they have to watch it. And they have to watch it not just once, they watch it three times, once with sound only, once with video only, and then once with everything together. They see a tremendous amount. To a person who does this activity, they will say, I looked more confident than I felt. Mm -hmm. And here's why. We only see as your audience what you show us. We don't have insight into what's going on inside you. We can't feel your rapid heart rate. We can't feel the shakiness, nor do we know what you intended to say. We only hear what you say. That's a, that's a big one. Like if yeah. you miss something and you're like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Nobody knows you didn't. That's exactly right. So taking this mindset of this perception deficit that what we feel and what people see are very different. So I call it the feel real divide. So what you feel is not always what really what people see. That's the first mindset. The second mindset is that it's not about you. Many of us get very self-absorbed when we speak. We're worried about all of us. It's actually called the spotlight effect. Psychologists have identified it. It's where we feel the spotlight's on us and everybody's focusing on us. The reality is everybody is walking around this planet with spotlights on themselves. So they're more focused internally than externally. So remember, it's not about you, it's about your audience. So if you can have this mindset shift of, I, I'm going to appear more confident than I feel, and I have value to bring to my audience rather than all the things that you focus on yourself, those two mindset shifts will help. Now you can do other things for symptomatic relief. Deep belly breaths are incredibly important. And what's interesting about deep belly breaths, like if you're doing yoga or Tai Chi, is it's the exhale that's most important. So if you take a three count in, take a six count out. So if you double your exhale to your inhale, it will help. And you only have to do it two or three times. So there are things we can do for our mindset. There are things we can do for our physicality. And there are things we can do to reduce our getting nervous in the first place, such as practice, not memorize, but practice, get present oriented, be focused on what you're doing in the moment rather than worrying about what's coming in the future. If you can do these things, all of a sudden you feel more comfortable and confident and your audience sees you that way. Nice. 
So let's let's uh, let's let's talk about different types of of situations where you need to communicate. I'll t- I'll tell you a story that just happened to me. So I was a mm-hmm. guest on a podcast, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm on like two podcasts a week, right? And yeah. usually it's a really interesting thing. You and I talk beforehand, and I did a little research on you, so I have some good questions, right? You did a little research on me, and we're we're both professional. So I get on this podcast, and I did it didn't feel like a fit for me, so I was kind of curious why I was there. So I said to the host. So before we start, I'd just like to know what about my resume, my book, what, you know, what, what had you think that I would provide value for your audience? I'd like to know before we start. And he goes, I don't know. I didn't book you. Let's, you know, we're going to find out. And immediately I was taken aback. So here go. Now, now my, my, my performance anxiety is up. I said, oh, great. So how is, how is the podcast going to happen what's going to happen he says well i have some notes here he says i'm going to introduce you from your bio and then i'm going to tell you to 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 uh tell me tell tell everybody why you're here and then the fear came up right like there's nothing to respond to there's not like all of a sudden i'm i'm on the show and i was i and you know so in my head this is unprofessional i think i'm just gonna tell him let's forget this because he's so arrogant and all this and you know I had to do my own internal work of no matter what cards I'm dealt, I have to show up my best. And as a leader, if I'm talking about leadership, I'm going to lead in a not ideal situation. So I did my own inner work there. What would you do in that situation? You're thrown for a loop, and you, but you have yeah. to perform. Absolutely. So, so my whole new book called Think Faster, Talk Smarter is all about what you're just describing. It's these impromptu, spontaneous situations. Because if you think about it, Mark, most of our communication especially as leaders, is spontaneous, right? We, we work really hard on the presentations and the meetings that we run. But in reality, a lot of what we do in our day-to-day life is spontaneous. Somebody asks a question, somebody asks for feedback, you make a mistake, you have to fix it. In the situation you found yourself in was spontaneous. You thought there was a whole plan for why you were there and you learned there wasn't. And the guy said, hey, we're just going to wing it. So in that moment, a couple things can help. One, Remind yourself that this is an opportunity. This isn't a threat. This is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to explore, to collaborate. It it could be that this person is a gateway to amazing things for you. But if you go in saying, oh, this guy's a jerk and he he can't believe he's not prepared, it's unprofessional, suddenly you get defensive, not only in your physical posture, but your tone is curt, your answers are short. But if you go in and say, hey, all right, I'm here. I've I've got the time uh, set aside. Let's do it. Let's see what happens. That open mindset, that approaching it as an opportunity can help. So that's the first thing. The second thing is in that circumstance, I would listen very, very carefully to the questions that do come up and see if there's a way that you can connect those questions to something that's meaningful to you and potentially to this person's audience. So it's about seeing it as an opportunity. It's about listening intently. And then it's about giving the best answers you can. So that I would have approached that by saying, oh, well, here we go. It's an adventure. Let's see what's happening. Whee! I'm going to listen <laughs> to see connection and go from there. I'm curious, how did it go? Uh, it was really interesting. So before we started, uh, he was fumbling around and kind of, and, and he had, it's a big podcast too. Um, lot, you know, lots of listeners, pretty famous yeah. podcast. Yeah. Um, but he, he, um, he was fumbling around and kind of doing some things. And I said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not ready yet. And I kind of confronted the whole situation. I said, I'm a little thrown uh, because I, I, I expected you to have done research. And I totally understand that this is the way you set this up. I just need a minute. And we, and then he started talking and we connected for a second. And then all of a sudden I felt my body relax. I just called the elephant out in the room because I was pissed actually. Yeah. Right. And, um, and I was thinking about my bookers and I, like, I told my bookers, I want to be on certain kind of podcasts, right. That kind of thing. Uh, and then we started the podcast and he didn't let me get in a word edgewise. The entire podcast <laughs> was, was a, 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 uh, referendum on how good he is in business. Uh, oh, man, so I got I'm to speak sorry. for 30 seconds and yeah. then, then he spoke for five minutes. I spoke for 30 seconds. He spoke for five. That was fine. Uh, I do appreciate two things you did when you called it as it is. And that's, that's an important thing to do, especially as a leader is, is to take that moment. Um, I have a colleague at the business school. His name is Collins Dobbs. He's a great guy. And he has this notion that he uses when you're having high impact high intensity conversations. He calls it pace, space, grace. And I've adapted his approach to listening. And and part of that 
pace is you got to slow things down space. You got to give yourself a little distance to, to, to really think through what you're, you're thinking. And then you have to give yourself a little grace, which is exactly what you did. You said, I'm taken aback at this moment. I wasn't expecting this. Give me a second to collect my thoughts. And that's wonderful that you gave yourself a little bit of grace there. Um, and the bottom line is you learned something then. You learned, one, to check to make sure in advance. And two, you're not going to do this guy's podcast again. So, you know, I always try to take the positive outcome of this. And, and those are two positive outcomes. Uh, and I, But yet, I'm sorry you had to go through that. I, I myself have been in those situations, and it's not pleasant. All right, this is a great time for you to tell the the TED Talk story that you told before we before we started. Uh, while you were telling the story, I was like, "This is too good not to." Yeah, so, so that TED Talk that I was talking so about. It's a story of serendipity, it, right? Yeah, it's a story of serendipity. So I, I have two TEDx talks out there, and I have a talk that was done at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. And for the business school talk, um, it was a, a every year the Stanford Business School has an alumni weekend. We bring our alums back. It's wonderfully fun. People reconnect. And part of it is they get to hear lectures from some of the, the teaching staff, professors, lecturers, et cetera. And somebody four days before bailed. They couldn't do it. I don't know if they got sick or something happened. This is pre-pandemic. And so they came to me. They said, hey, do you mind stepping in? On Saturday, which was four days away, we, we have a space that, that people are coming to, but we don't have a speaker. And they came to me because they know I study speaking anxiety, I do communication. They figured of all the faculty, I might be the least likely to freak out at this opportunity. So, you know, again, as I shared with you, I'm big on opportunity. I said, yes, sure. It's eight in the morning. Who's going to be there? I, I'll, I'll be fine. So right before I get on the stage, the woman who invited me says, hey, do you mind if we simulcast those? There's some alums who, who aren't going to be able to make it. And I'm thinking, all right, fine. It's eight in the morning on a Saturday. Most people are going to be with their kids playing soccer or asleep. What I didn't realize is what came along with simulcasting in real time was that they recorded it. And from that posting, that talk took off like wildfire. There was a time, Mark, where if you searched public speaking on Google, this talk was the first result. It just, mm -hmm. it just hit the algorithm in the right time in the right way. And again, serendipity. It was complete coincidence, you know, that I said yes to an opportunity where somebody bailed. And it turned out, it turned one of my rules of, of living my life is whenever possible, say yes. It uh, doesn't mean you have to follow. It doesn't mean you're going to say yes ultimately, but at least be curious and see what presents itself. Because in my life, it's played out pretty well. Yeah, it's such a such a such a great story because you know that that actually changed your tra career trajectory. That's that it. one talk I, actually I, gave me a lot of exposure for sure. I sent that I sent, I sent that video to everybody because well thank you you know thank told you. told this the same guy who's now being considered to be ceo i sent him that video i'm like this guy right like we have to we have oh, to do thank this. you so let's let's in in your new book i'm thinking you're touching on these subjects because it's not out yet and i don't have a copy but i did as much research as i could you talk about like when you get thrown into a situation where you have to talk uh and and you're not prepared you know, what do you, what do you do in a situation like that? Where, where you're like, Hey, you know, the person who is going to uh, talk at the lunch meeting, isn't going to be there. Can you just step in? How do you, how do you figure out what to talk about? How do you prepare yourself? Yeah. So, so the irony of spontaneous speaking is that you can actually do a fair amount of preparation. So then when it happens, you're ready to go. So the, the irony is that you can prepare to be spontaneous. And for some people that it's hard to get your head around. So let me, let me give some ideas. So if you are in a situation where you know it is likely that you go into these circumstances thinking, here are the things I need to say, when in fact, the most important question you should ask is, what does the audience need to hear? And by doing that quickly, just thinking about who's the audience, what's the, the value I can bring here, that helps you focus. So when you have to speak in the moment, there are two fundamental tasks. You have to think about what to say and how to say it. So this is the what to say part. It's about prioritizing, make it relevant, important for your audience. So think very quickly, what's going to be important for the audience in this moment? So before I joined you, I, I've listened to your podcast for a while. I, I understand your approach. I understand who your audience is. So what I'm saying today is trying to be best suited for them. Now, the other part of it is not just what to say, but how to say it. And this is where you can really do a lot of practice. I am a huge proponent of structure. I believe the most effective communication is well-structured. And by that, I mean logically connected, beginning, middle, end. I'm not saying a list of information. In fact, our brains do not process lists very well. Bullet points aren't effective. Bullets kill, don't use bullet points. Instead, 
have a structure. So if you go into a spontaneous situation, knowing what the audience likely needs, and you have a structure you can use, you can be better off. So let me give you one quick example of a structure. A structure that many people listening likely know is a structure that's called the problem solution benefit structure. You start by identifying a problem, you talk about your solution to the problem, and then the benefits that result from it. If anybody has ever pitched anything, tried to get an idea across, tried to persuade, this is a very common structure. So if I know what my audience needs and I know that structure, I can then get through a spontaneous circumstance. It's like having a recipe. If you have a recipe and you have ingredients, you can likely cook a pretty decent dish. That makes that makes sense. Okay, so let's let's say you're let's say I'm I'm just gonna, I'm gonna uh, every situation I have ever been in or any of my clients have ever been in, you're gonna fix. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> That's a lot of pressure, man. I'll do right? my best. Yeah, well, this this is called communicate communication rapid fire. Uh, okay, here we go. So you so you're in the boardroom. Uh, and you are blindsided by a question or something went wrong that had you, you had responsibility for, but you didn't know it was going to be brought up in a meeting. So you're sitting in a meeting and all of a sudden you're, conf you're the spotlight's on you. And it isn't, and it, it, it it's, again, it's a, a question you may not know the answer to something, that, but you just freeze. What do you do then? So is the question, what do you do when you freeze? Or is the question, how do you respond to that situation? Because I have answers for both. Why don't I give answers well, well, for well, both? You should give me answers for both because I have ADD. And uh, yeah, Okay, there you go. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so when you are in a circumstance where you are put under the spot and you are not expecting it, again, you need to give yourself a little bit of space to get your thoughts together. A great way to get space is there are three ways. One, pause. Many of us feel very uncomfortable pausing. Pausing is normal and natural. Second, you can ask clarifying questions. So if you say, hey, why did this failure happen? And what's going on? I could say, are you talking about this last month? Are you talking about over the course of the year? So I can ask clarifying questions. Not only does that help me better understand what you need, again, we want to be in service of our audience, but it also gives me time to think. Alternatively, a third way, a question, and then you can also paraphrase. So I can extract the keys and what we can do to avoid failing in the future. That's a paraphrase. And that, again, also buys me time and helps me focus. So first thing you got to do in those circumstances is give yourself a little bit of time. And those are tools you can use. Many of us feel compelled. We have to respond immediately. And you can take a little beat. I'm not taking, saying take 10 minutes. I'm saying take a couple seconds, collect your thoughts. It's amazing how a couple seconds to you feels like an eternity to everybody else. It feels like nothing. That's I, exactly I, right. I can take two deep belly breaths before I say something. It's going to come out much different. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what you just did there is a great paraphrase. So you see, you've got that natural skill. So buy yourself a little time and then respond as best you can. If you do not know the answer, say, I do not know, but immediately follow it up with what you'll do to find out and tell them the time frame you'll get back. If you have a hunch or an inkling, let them know. So I might say, so what you're really asking about is what is the core issue that brought around about this potential failure? I don't know the exact answer. I'm going to get back with my team. And by end of day tomorrow, I'm going to have an answer. My hunch is it has to do with the system protocols that we just implemented. Oh, I love That's that. Give them a bone. I love it. Right, right. But, but, and again, it's an educated guess. It's not a wild ass, you know, something. It's an educated guess. Now, if you free, if you can't remember what to say and you want to say something, a couple of things you can do. One Go back to go forward. You know, if you lose your keys, how do you find them? You retrace your steps. So if I'm in the midst of speaking and I blank out, just repeat what you just said. Most of us can remember what we just said. It gets us back on track. The other thing you can do is ask a question to buy yourself time. So if I, again, if somebody asks me a question and I'm like, oh my goodness, I don't know how to answer. I can ask a question that distracts them effectively so I can get back on track. I do this all the time when I teach. I teach the same course twice every quarter. So it's a lot of teaching of the same course. I love teaching it. I'm very passionate about it. But sometimes I can't remember. Did I say that in this class or was it the other class? So I forget. So when in those moments when I need just to think a little bit more, I'll just stop and say, I'd like to pause. I'd love for you to think about how what we've just discussed can be applied in your life. And my students aren't thinking, oh, Matt forgot. My students are thinking, wow, how do I apply this in my life? So each of us can come up with a question appropriate for our environment, appropriate for our status in the room that can get people, in essence, distracted for a moment so we can focus. So there are things you can do to buy yourself time and there are things you can do to uh, remind yourself if you blank out. 
what's the best way to be effective? All right. So let's say you're in the boardroom and you're, they're going, you're going around and everybody's giving their reports for mm -hmm. what's going on in their department or, you know, or, or their ideas. What's the best way to, to show up in that situation so that you're, you're, you're a powerful leader and you're also part of a team uh, and so that you can be heard? So a couple of things I want to share there. One is uh, if there's a lot of conversation going on and you want to wedge your voice into that conversation, three things to do. Uh, paraphrasing is key. So if I want to wedge my voice in, I can simply paraphrase something you said. I could say, Mark, that point about this. So I just summarize your point and that gives me a wedge or an entry point. I can ask a question. I can say cost. That's something I'm really concerned with because, and ask a question. I can lead with emotion. I'm excited about, so I can lead with an emotion, Ooh. I can lead with a question, or I can lead with just paraphrasing. It gives you permission to put your voice into the conversation. So leading in one of those three ways can wedge you into the conversation. A way to get your point across is to say it very clearly and concisely. I have another structure that I love. It is three questions. What, so what, now what? The what is your point, it's your product, it's your service, it's your idea, your belief. The so what is why is it important to the people in the room or beyond? And then what's next or the now what? what what's, is it, let's set up another meeting. Let me take your questions. Let me show you something. So when I have to give an update, when I have to assert my point of view, I will say, here's my point of view, what? Here's why it's important. And here's what I think we should do about it. So what, so what, now what? Just answering those three questions can help you be clear and concise and directed in what you say. So if you wedge your point of view in, then make a concise contribution and you're done. Wow, so useful. So now let's let's add a little persuasion in. Now you need to sell an idea. You need, you need, you need to do it, you need to get your salesman hat on. How do you add that ingredient into your communication? Yeah. So being persuasive and influential is critical. Uh, what we know is that if people trust you and respect you, it helps. Uh, listening is more important in persuading than speaking. So trying to ask the right questions, showing that you're listening can be very, very important. When it comes to being influential, the most important thing you have to do is help people understand the relevance of what you're saying and appreciate the areas of resistance, hesitation, or concern that they might have that prevent them from acting. Whenever you are trying to influence or persuade somebody, you have to think about two distinct approaches to take. One is to focus on all the reasons why they should do what you think they should do. We call those promoting messages. And then you also have to think about the restraining forces. What prevents somebody from doing something? Mm. And sometimes the most effective persuasive messages are the ones that remove restraining forces rather than ones that just promote what you should do. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, when I went to grad school, I had a friend. We both graduated college, same time. He went into the professional world right away. I went to grad school. Uh, suffice it to say, he made a lot more money more quickly than, than I, he, anyway, he's done very, very well. I have not done as well. And all when I was in grad school, he'd keep coming to me and say, hey, let's go, let's go to Tahoe, let's go to Hawaii. I mean, he had this disposable income that I did not have. And he would try to persuade me all the great reasons for going to Hawaii, going to Tahoe. I understood all those reasons. The restraining force, I didn't have time and I didn't have money. So all of the promoting messages were just frustrating me. Right. It's not that I didn't understand going to Hawaii is fun. I got that. It's I couldn't do it. So sometimes the better persuasion is to actually target the things that prevent somebody from doing something and help equip them there. And that's what's going to get them to come to your side of the, uh, or be persuaded by what you're saying. So it, it all boils down to understanding your audience, to listening, and then ultimately figuring out, am I promoting or am I working on restraining forces? And for the restraining orders, I would, my, my guess is it's questions. It's you, if you don't know, you know, what yes, would hold absolutely. you back from this? What is the detriment? I talk about that when, when you're, when you're, when you're stacking the deck uh, yeah. and, and you're, and you know, you're trying to get your idea across, you want to know how your idea impacts every single other person in the room before you put your idea out there. So go and find out, right? Stack yeah. the deck before you bring something up. I call it reconnaissance, reflection, and research. You have to do all three of the, the three R's before you actually assert your point of view, reconnaissance, reflection, and research. And sometimes that's talking to people. Sometimes that's surveying people. Sometimes that's doing it online, looking at their LinkedIn profiles, looking at their company bios. There's a lot we can do to learn about the people we're speaking to. Nice. Okay. Let's, let's, you, by the way, you're batting a thousand 
on oh. rapid fire communication <laughs> skills. Uh, you are you okay. are crushing this. Well, I'm let's not very good at baseball, so let's see if I can keep it up. Let's say you let's say you screw up. Well, uh, your 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 karate. Uh, you, I do. I do martial arts. That's martial arts. that's true. Which, which flavor of martial arts? I've done several. The one I have my highest rank in is one called Kenpo. Nice, nice. Okay, so listen, you made a mistake with someone. You really screwed up. You you insulted them. You talked behind them. Like you just screwed up, uh, which we all do. How do you fix it? Uh, so first and foremost, you have to acknowledge that you made uh, the mistake. Many times when we apologize, we apologize for how we made the person feel, not for what we did. I'm sorry you're upset versus I'm sorry I mispronounced your name, right? Which I'm happened sorry, to make I'm you really upset. I'm really sorry I mispronounced your name and you told me. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. And I didn't use that example for that. I used it because I, I had a student just yesterday whose name I mispronounced. And I did exactly what I'm sharing with you as I said, I'm really sorry I mispronounced your name. And then acknowledge what that might feel like for the person. So I'm sorry I mispronounced your name. I know that that can be off-putting or distracting. So you, you comment on what you've done. You then acknowledge the feelings that it might bring on somebody. Right. And then you, you say what you're going to do differently next time. So I, I said, next time when I meet somebody whose name is difficult to pronounce, I will ask first. So... You have to, uh, too often we apologize or don't apologize. And when we do apologize, we apologize for how we made the person feel versus what we did. And we don't explain how it's going to change our behavior. So a good apology, I think, includes all three of those. Acknowledging what you did, understanding or expressing how it made the person feel, and then specifically detailing what you will do differently to remedy the situation. So I just, I had to apologize the other day in a meeting I was in where I was so passionate about the topic, I was interrupting people. And there was one person in particular who I interrupted more than others. And so at the end of the meeting, I, I publicly in front of everybody, I just said, I need you all to know that I'm very passionate about this topic. Let's, let's call this person, Steve. I said, you know, Steve, I know I interrupted you several times when you were in the midst of speaking. I can imagine that that awkward and I'm sure everybody in the room thought rude and felt embarrassed interrupted i promise in the next meeting before i speak i will let i will listen and i will paraphrase what everybody has said before i contribute next so that type of apology was which was accepted by steve uh i believe is a complete apology that is that, i love that that's uh fantastic I, I love that you screw up too like in communication <laughs> Right? Like, I make lots of mistakes. It, it's 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 so funny. It's, you know, like like I, I teach this thing victim owner, right? Yeah. yeah like you know, like you know, victim mentality. Uh, you know, uh, and and I, I when I find myself being a victim, right, yeah. and calling it out, and 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 realizing that I'm human, and you know that I teach this stuff because I'm learning it every day, you know, along with everybody else. Last question, bonus question on uh, on on uh, communication rapid fire is um giving feedback this is this for me uh you know i like you and i talked about this i give out copies of radical candor like mm -hmm. uh like like they're water like i, I have a whole team and i'm like your job is all because you're all too affable too nice uh you know you need to read radical candor uh shout out for kim scott um, yes what's your version of giving really good feedback so uh, I love Kim Scott. She's a neighbor. Uh, she and I go for walks. Uh, and radical candor, I think, is an important. Oh, can you way record to think about those? People. Oh my God, that would be great. <laughs> uh, no, I don't want to record those. That would be bad. Um, <laughs> but uh, the so I, I I a lot of what Kim says I think is right on, and and I would never contradict any of it because I think it's fantastic. A few things I add when I think about feedback. To me, feedback is an invitation to problem solve. Clearly, there's feedback that you have to issue that just absolutely means somebody has to stop something. Somebody's doing something inappropriate. They're doing something risky, dangerous. That's not an opportunity to problem solve. You have to stop it, and you stop it directly. But many times, the types of feedback we have to give, it is best served if we can get the other person engaged in helping resolve the problem. That's why I say it's an invitation to problem solve. So the first thing I think it's important in giving feedback is you have to clearly understand as the feedback giver what it is you're focusing on. What is the issue at hand? What is the thing that I want to give feedback on? So you have to have focus. Often emotion plays out in these circumstances. You're frustrated, you're concerned, you're sad, you're disappointed. So we have to realize there's emotion and find ways to express that emotion that don't get in the way. Because we want to focus on the person, 
not uh, the person in the problem, not the emotion necessarily. Once we have gone through that and we know what it is we're focusing on and we think about the emotion and we then have to think about what is it we want? What does success look like? And then finally, you issue feedback. And I think what, so what, now what is a great structure for giving quick feedback. Mm. What is your feedback? The so what is why it's important. And the now what is what you'd like them to do differently. So imagine, Mark, you and I come out of a meeting and you say, hey, Matt, what do you think? How'd that meeting go? And I might say, Mark, you did a great job, except when you covered the implementation plan. You spoke quickly and you didn't give as much detail as you did in other parts of your presentation. That's the what. When you speak quickly and don't give as much detail, people might think you're not as prepared and you're a little nervous about that topic, which might not present you well. That's the so what. What I'd like you to do next time you give this presentation, give a little more depth into these two examples for the implementation and speak a little slower. That's the now what. So simply using that structure, that recipe, that roadmap, I can give clear, concise feedback, but I had to do the pre-work. What is it I'm focusing on? What is it that uh, my emotions are around this? And then finally, what's the ultimate goal, which in this case is you give the implementation portion of your presentation, it's due. So those are the ways I approach feedback as a as an opportunity to problem solve. I love I love that 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 shift. That's a that's a great perspective to bring to that. So curious, what's the what's the difference between your first book and your second book? Like, why did you write the second book? Yes, thank you. That's a that's a good question. Uh, so the first book primarily focuses speaking up without freaking out is exclusively focused on how to help people feel more comfortable, confident in general communication, planned or spontaneous. The second book, Think Faster, Talk Smarter, is really about, it, it talks a bit about anxiety because that's critical in all communication as we discussed, but it's more of a methodology for how to speak better in the moment. So managing anxiety is one step in the methodology, but there are five other steps, many dealing with mindset, a few dealing with the message structure itself. And then the second part of the book, which I am so excited about, the Think Faster, Talk Smarter book is six scenarios or situations we often find ourselves in that are spontaneous, and it gives very specific practical and tactical advice you can use to get through them. Making small talk, uh, making an apology, introducing somebody, giving a toast, a tribute, though answering questions. Those are the things that the second part of the book talks about. And everything we talked about in rapid fire. Yeah, absolutely. This was <laughs> which, which you did now... a good job of addressing some of the topics for sure. <laughs> I, I'm I'm going to be the first one to order uh, pre-order a book and uh, and have it on my shelf. Matt, thanks for what you do. Thanks for being on the show. If Thank you so much, Mark. I, I love your approach to leadership and I love how you are so encouraging of your guests. Thank you. Uh, how can people find you if they want more of you? Thanks. So I'm a big user of LinkedIn, connecting with me on LinkedIn. Yeah, all I have a ton of resources and, and everything that I do from the podcast, Think Fast, Talk Smart, to my books, to resources, like you mentioned, mattabrahams.com. Mattabrahams.com has all of that stuff. Great place and to go first. All those links are going to be in the show notes. If you forget that when you're driving in the car, you can just click that. I appreciate you. Uh, I'm going to give you back the rest of your day. Thanks for being here.